in a in a way to further my explanatory narrative, um, I want to sort of explore an issue. Um, Uh, which uh, the, the semantics of it are, are not the best. Um, immature and mature. Uh, these are the wrong labels for what I'm trying to get at. Um, but they work well enough as a shorthand. Um, a more technically correct label for immature would probably be like nescient. Um, uh so I'm, I'm just going to explore this topic as a way to kind of flesh out some aspects of my explanatory narrative and to talk about um, psychological behavior on the level of, of uh, the four sides of the mind, um, which will be speculative, but hopefully will shed some light um, into some greater synthesis. I, I don't know who I should be giving credit um, to. Uh, uh, the the um, oh my word, I've forgotten his name. Um, uh, ah, uh, John Beebe. Um, I understand that the, the, the basic framework that I'm going off of was a synthesis of um, some kind of um, innovation that Asif Joseph made in combining other people's um, work. So uh, John Beebe's uh, uh, labeling and, and sort of functional... Um, Uh, interconnectedness uh, between eight functions which he named like uh, you know and, and so we get sort of very useful terminology like the responsible parents and the trickster and such um, and um, I think what I'm drawing off of though is not um, Linda Barron's uh, uh, interaction styles I'm, I'm not I, I don't really care about the um, but I mean that might also be a big piece of the puzzle in terms of see if Joseph CS Joseph Joseph is uh, um, synthesis of these things but um, anyway in as much as the the um, uh, the the role that the functions play uh, toward each other on top of the four sides of the mind, um, that that is sort of what I'm running with, and I'm uh, I'm using this to correspond to my theory because my theory effectively had uh, three sides of the mind, and it had something like the fourth side of the mind, which I just did not include as part of what I would call the false ego complex, because I would consider that matter to be the kind of um, the origin of um, the sides of the mind, the rest of the sides of the mind are, are somewhat, um, are, are a kind of internalized drama, um, and are fundamentally false, whereas in uh, the superego actually has something that correlates to, um, the real history, as it were, um, anyway, uh, this is, so I just wanted to say that I, I don't know what, um, what credit uh, I uh, and and sort of source uh, how I should reference um, these things. So I'm just going to put that blurb out there. Um, now I'm going to get into some of my own interpretation, I guess, of, of these matters. So um, when I say immature. Uh, I really discussed uh, uh, the inappropriateness of this label, but um, I just want to further make points of information that it's not in some way as if mature is better than immature in terms of pathology. They, they are both pathological because the false ego itself is fundamentally pathological. And so both mature and immature are prone to pathologies 
and one could argue that the um, the mature pathologies are by far more worse that they, they are more toxic um, in some sense the thing that the immature um, uh, mode of being in the psyche uh, is 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 uh, open to much less uh, much lesser forms of corruption and it, it is innately more authentic and I would and, and now I'm going to be making some generalizations because there will be specific manifestations of psyche that will kind of um, they won't fit into the categories but I mean in as much as I'm going to try to generate explanatory narratives, it will give you a greater sense as to the kind of dysfunction that certain things might be prone to. There might even be a kind of compromised maturity that kind of is, well, those are the more toxic forms of, 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 of maturity, perhaps, is that it kind of mimics an immaturity, which it doesn't really have the ability to really kind of uh, settle itself into believing. Uh, so there's a kind of an added layer of self-deception and there's an added mechanism that has to be required in order to maintain that self-deception. Um, okay, now I'm getting too much into the issues that I wanted to speak about. But um, And then there are also um, features which I'm not going to be able to properly cover that will, that will sort of go into um, how there are forms of arrested immaturity um, in that the, 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 the immaturity is not able to develop um, and then how that perhaps also turns into a, a quite a kind of atrophied um, psyche that, that, has to, uh, that, that has some kind of pseudo stability in, in that um, atrophy and, and that uh, you know th that leads you know to other kinds of, of pathologies and and uh, a kind of uh, usually the the toxicity that I'm talking about is is uh, a kind of social influence um, in that you you will generally have to have a, a weird kind of codependency on some kind of environmental energy in order to essentially externalize what would otherwise be an internal tension and if you can sort of outsource that kind of psychic energy, that psychic work, that psychic effort, then you don't have to build internally the the level of experience needed to witness the the kind of the recurring drama, the kind of the the metaphysical tug of war that's going on, the kind of the the um, the internal stalemate. Um, now, these issues are centered generally around the subconscious. Maturity or immaturity have to do with um, the standing of the subconscious. And I'm, I'm going to keep on making these metaphors to the Matrix, and it, it will be required that you watch the Matrix movies because it's going to be way too much explanatory work. Um, but in as much as the plot of the Matrix, uh, I'm, I'm going to definitely use the plot. Uh, um, okay, so uh, oh, I just also wanted to make a comment that um, I have not spent a lot of time uh, at all. I mean, I think in total I've literally watched like three and a half videos on C.S. Joseph's YouTube and uh, a lot of them were on my INTJ type and, you know, definitely seems very uh, uh, useful and, and you know, uh, as much as MBTI has a purchase on, on things, it seems to be great. Um, my level of, of analysis is somewhat deeper. Um, and uh, what was the other point that I wanted to make here? Is that, um, oh, okay, I, I just generally want, wanted to make the point that I think that when people are banding about the uh, the term shadow focus, subconscious focus, super ego focused. These things are, I, I mean, I can understand them being used because they have to kind of um, be able to explain a non-typical presentation or something that is, that kind of breaks the general stereotype or something like that. But th they're just too vague and you'll never be able to 
really deconstruct that vagueness until you actually have an explanatory na narrative as to how the sides of the mind um, ontologically uh, relate to one another and how they functionally within some idea of normalcy or at least some idea about how they might develop and how they might be arrested in their developments you're not going to get anywhere so um yeah so so this is partly why i'm going into this kind of work now so um so uh, yeah so all my insight is pretty much projected from my personal typology which i'm still not going to be introducing um simply because uh the MBTI corresponding um, model of it is close enough. Um, basically, the only difference is, is, is uh, this is not actually true. I mean, but there are levels of, um, of subtype within my system which are nuanced and very, you know, which would give some depth, some further depth into a lot of things. I don't know how useful that necessarily be, but um, uh, this is partly why I wanted to correspond my system to an MBTI system, because I wanted to steal some kind of experiential research that people have in, you know, at least if they can clearly enough group people together and collect kind of uh, the traits of their behavior or, so, or, or a kind of social manifestation of, of their um psychological traits you know that that would that would be able to sort of um, infuse my typology with a level of interpretive grasp that um, I've simply not had because I've just been developing it for most of my life um, which sounds unbelievable but uh, anyway um, so uh, yeah I mean when I say most of my life I mean now uh, six sevenths of my life has been devoted to this project from the age of five and now I'm 32 so yeah that sounds probably pretty ridiculous um, but anyway uh, I'm not going to I, I think I've explored that topic somewhere else on my YouTube and it's not pertinent to what I'm getting into now so let me just get let me just jump right in um, Okay, so generally the, the characteristic of the immature type is that um, it is somewhat, um, it is prone to invest in the subconscious. It wants to develop the subconscious. It wants to see the ceiling in the subconscious. It has not yet seen the limits of the subconscious. And so in that way, it is nescient of of the kind of of the of the metaphysical troubles that that are yet to be discovered okay um in my explanatory nar narrative i tried to to uh, i don't know if i got this far because there were some elements that i couldn't remember while i was sort of trying to give that kind of dissertation but um essentially um the subconscious is primary is, is originally created by the unconscious mind before the unconscious was unconscious, when it was effectively um, the inner child, is what I generally call the unconscious mind, but I'll just continue to call it the unconscious. So the unconscious creates um, the, uh, the subconscious because essentially it wants an interface that, that can be interesting to it, because the unconscious mind is um, too complete uh, it's too ho holistic, um, and so it, it's actually prone to a kind of solipsism. It, it almost sees itself as its own god, because it sort of is the arbiter of the knowledge of good. And it only knows this knowledge of good, and in some sense that is a symbolic value that it gives its, its child function. So its child function really controls reality. Now this is suffocating to itself, and so it effectively tries to create a hypothetical machine that can bring it some kind of something interesting, something potentially challenging of itself. So when it creates the subconscious mind, in some sense, 
it is trying to synthesize its knowledge of good with the way of the world, uh, which is generally um, uh, conceptualized uh, uh, as the superego, which it is actually kind of, um, uh, yeah, so the, the, the primordial kind of building block of, of, of the false ego is the unconscious and the superego. And essentially what the unconscious has done is it, it believes that the, the superego is just part of metaphysical reality. It's not, the, the unconscious itself is not a strategy to, um, to cope with, with, with something that it is confronted with. It is just regarded as true being. So the stack, the functional stacking in the unconscious mind is just, that's what it means to be uh, a living being. And so the kind of the agitation which the superego symbolizes just kind of blends into the fabric of reality. It is, in some sense, just the way of the world. Now, when it creates the subconscious, in some sense, um, and it creates the subconscious as a way for it to kind of um, hypothetically explore a challenge to itself, which it doesn't even believe in, in some sense. So it's like um, when the unconscious creates the subconscious, it's just to amuse one's own mind in some sense. It's a hypothetical matrix. It's a, it's a hypothetical alternative reality. It's like it's literally a game. It is, the un, it is a game to the unconscious. Now this becomes problematic because essentially this game is prone to a level of inconsistency. It's, it's prone to a metaphysical inconsistency, which the unconscious mind was not anticipating. But this was actually the, mis the mystery machine that it was actually hoping for in some sense, that, but it was not, it was thinking that it would be able to solve the mysteries, that it would have the resources to, in order to kind of um, contend with them and almost hypothetically grow with them. And so the hypothetical growth to the subconscious essentially is an alternative mode of being which essentially is represented by the ego so in some sense the ego is the conscious conscience as in like the kind of oh that was good, the moral judgment of the subconscious resides in the ego and essentially the unconscious manifests the ego as a mask uh, that it is, you know, so there is a fundamental truth here, which is that essentially the ego is the mask of the unconscious mind um, to act in the subconscious. That's the purpose of it is, is for it to act in the subconscious. Um, now, as soon as the subconscious gets exhausted at some point, and when I say exhausted, I mean metaphysically exhausted. And it gets metaphysically exhausted when what when the mechanics of what I have just said basically come into fruition. So to use the, the, the metaphor of the matrix, when Neo is still learning out how to exploit the matrix using his superpowers, which is essentially um, by his uh, appropriation and decomposition of the, the trickster in the unconscious. So in some sense, he's saying, the trickster is an evil person that is posed up against me. I go into the matrix to, to combat his agents. And essentially, I am learning his tools, which uh, uh, are the nemesis and the, um, the, pair, um, the nemesis and the critic function. So essentially, the, the ego is wrestling the nemesis and the critic function away from the trickster. And when he does that so that he has a kind of full control of the matrix where he's a god, then what is left to do? You know, then in some sense, you know, he has to get real. He has to, well, you know, there's no point in making the matrix your bitch. There's no point in walking into the space and being a god. 
what what would to actually make a difference you would have to sort of go meet the machines in reality and sort of you know ask them to shut down the matrix where where you're not so much a god you, um you know you, you you what's the point of finding the architect inside the matrix you need to find the art, architect outside the matrix um you know so so the fighting within the matrix is is a farce it's it's uh it's useless um it's it it it, it has no real fundamental purpose or direction um And so the subconscious effectively is just a way for the ego to steal value or to simulate the stealing of value from the trickster and place that value in, in the ego's child function. Essentially to say that this is the repository of the knowledge of good and we have to fight the trickster for it through the subconscious in order to keep that, that epistemological value uh, to keep that conduit alive. And in some sense, without the subconscious, there is no ego. So, as soon as the subconscious starts becoming a kind of psychic necessity, uh, or a necessity for supplying psychic energy to the ego, the whole thing essentially becomes a very clear and transparent um, exchange between the unconscious and the ego and that um, that uh, essentially becomes this kind of eternal tug of war and so in as much as that the unconscious needs the ego to sort out the metaphysical incoherence in the subconscious itself because otherwise the subconscious will effectively be taken over by the superego or the superego will consume the subconscious. Um, uh, now, I actually believe that um, that in some sense is the is the final solution that I, I do think is what needs to happen you need to revert back to your unconscious and your super ego and and actually then resolve that that issue um and you know maybe when you do it from the other end when you've created uh, uh okay uh, uh, i didn't get into the mechanics of how essential okay well i mean i think it's, it's obvious that the ego is siphoning the unconscious and I went into these mechanics before as well. Um, in my other recording, so I'm not going to spend too much time here, but I'm just going to make the distinction between immature and mature. So what I see happening. Uh, this problem, I think, can happen both in immature and mature cases, although I think that there's more of a bad faith elements in the in the mature case of what i'm about to describe is is in order to kind of keep an excuse to enter the matrix to enter the subconscious from the ego side uh what effectively has to happen is that there has to be an impediment put on the powers of the of the superhero ego in some sense so the Neo has to still be in this constant struggle of learning mastery over the subconscious. And the only way to do that is to make his tools somewhat defective. And so essentially you have to steal uh, some key component or at least some vital aspect in the nemesis or the critic. And so essentially what you do is you dismember the nemesis or the critic and you hide that in you, you kind of bury it under the foundation of the child function and the ego to kind of prop it up. So the child function, in some sense, has got uh, an elevated status and an elevated, it, it believes itself to be in, in um, command or in possession of some extra power 
but it's hidden under the foundation of the child. You know, sort of, it's been mixed in with concrete and it's sort of, this was dud, done in the dead of night by the parent function in the ego. So the parent has uh, somewhat nefariously um, dismembered the critic and the nemesis, uh, sorry, yeah, the critic and the nemesis, and it has, um, in the dead of night, buried those, those parts of those functions under the child function. And this creates a, a blind spot in the nemesis and the critic. And this blind spot, therefore, will, will kind of generate a kind of recurring drama. Um, and so, you know, if, you know, if, with some experience, you start to notice that, uh, I mean, if uh, this, is, this is not necessarily the case, but you would say generally, after long enough, you might think back on your life and say, actually, this is a cyclical drama that is recurring that I keep on sort of orchestrating around me. This, I think, can also be virtually done. What I've just described doesn't have to be an internal perversion in some sense. It could be an externalized one in which one is relying on somebody else to do this for you. And so by your association, by your membership in some kind of orchestrated organization or society or ideology or something like that, you, you are, um, effectively, you're outsourcing the same mechanism that you end up sort of, now, now uh, this, is, this is not necessarily true, but I believe that this, this is primarily occurs through the conduit of, of a kind of TI culture or an FE culture or a lot of those things can somewhat be... Um, uh, I mean, so I do believe that that is the access, uh, the axi of, um, I mean, you could always, you could, you could almost call it sort of being a part of the world of, of a worldly dominion of, of a kind of, uh, of, uh, the principalities of the air, uh, you know, that, that is how people open themselves up to, you could call it ideological possession and such. And, and this, you know, to a large extent, is what culture subsists in. And there are kind of slipstreams in which this kind of unconsciousness is sort of promulgated and, and exchanged and developed and such and such. Uh, anyway, I'm just going to put that to one side. Um... I also wanted to point out that um, I do think that there is uh, these sorts of things that I'm describing are actually what are the issues that are being explored in revelations uh, in the Christian scripture. My interpretation, uh, my understanding of the doctrine is very different um, from most so-called Christians. But uh, I'll just say that I, I do think that um, the dreams being... Uh, uh, recorded in, in revelations are um show a process essentially of of the de of the destruction of the world the end of the world uh which is a, a psychological phenomena it's not a uh, it's not a it's not an earthly um uh prediction uh, these are internal spiritual mechanisms um and I, I do think that, uh, and I'm oh, sorry, this I was going to link more to the issue of, of the, the mature case. You see, the, the, the mature case is closer to some kind of resolution to the superego. Um, but because, it, be, because it, it has, uh, it should know better or it should be kind of grappling with, with the mysteries in the right way, which is always the problem because the problem is not finding the right answers the problem is asking the right questions and so not grappling with the mysteries um and kind of taking an easy way out and just wanting to kind of have your cake and eat it and sort of just stabilize the ego or stabilize the false ego you know that is is going to essentially um lead to a much more kind of cynical jaded corroded 
um, way of sustaining the psyche. And, you know, generally it looks particularly bad. You know, there's a level of, not to, not to get too paradoxical, but there's a level of immaturity that only, ma only mature types can orchestrate for this reason is because they are effectively rudderless ships. They have no, uh, they, 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 they're not interested in, in cohering into, uh, cohering their experience into a kind of, into a purpose that's going to tackle the, the challenge as it's kind of at least somewhat been revealed. And so the the relinquishing of that kind of responsibility and accountability um it has to have a functional mechanical sympathy that, that is being manifested between the sides of the mind and um let me just perhaps go into some of those so i mean so you know if you know that the whole thing is a pretty much a farce anyway well then you know, maybe you'll just live out the rest of your life in your subconscious, which I would consider to be the most unhealthy and deluded part of the mind. Now, you see, that that is different for young people, for or not for young people, but for immature types. Immature types, they actually have to focus on the subconscious because they have to see the ceiling of it. They have to see the limits of it. Whereas when an immature type is indulging in their subconscious, there's there's a bad faith component to it essentially and it's like you know well you know they're they're pretending that they're learning some some new lesson but they've already you know it's not going to be found in the subconscious you know the the the, the um and so th that okay yeah um they were i did, i think i've done a very bad job of, of talking about this stuff but um uh, I think that pretty much covers um, what I wanted to say. Uh, let me just, I've, I made some points which I knew I had left out of the last recording. I just want to make sure that I covered them. Um, Yeah, I, I'm using the knowledge of good and the knowledge of evil slightly as a metaphor, but I do think that it, it does, there would be a more technical breakdown that traces the, the, the thread from the, the kind of thing that is happening at the beginning of the creation of the false ego, or the false ego complex. But in some sense, the reason why the superego is is completely overshadowed by the unconsciousness so much so that it doesn't even exist according to the unconscious is because the unconscious knows what good is and so it doesn't have to know what evil is because the one is also the other and when essentially the ego steals the knowledge of good from the unconscious then the same unconsciousness in some sense that the super ego is generally always veiled by is used against the trickster function effectively and that has to essentially be maintained by a continual maligning of the trickster which is basically sustained through incursions into the subconscious and so the subconscious is like the 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 um the atmosphere and the oxygen that is keeping the ego alive and the ego has its dominance essentially triangulated um between the subconscious and the um, unconscious, but the ego has recourse to something greater, is the ego essentially has some vision of the, the, the superego. Because of its kind of weird one foot in each, you know, one foot on, on the soil and one foot in the ocean, it's able to see the... Um, It's able to see uh, the outline of um, uh, the of the super ego, which means it's able to see past. Uh, it is it's able to get a glimpse of what what that there was something happening before the unconscious, because the unconscious is is the first 
domino of self-deception in some sense. Um, And it was only out of the hubris of that domino creating the subconscious that sort of let the door into some kind of greater um, hopefully some sort of greater resolution um, in the synthesis of these uh, sort of incoherent forces. Um, yeah, all these problems really manifest from the creation of the um, of the unconscious mind, and which is also the same thing as the creation of the superego. Those things somewhat happen simultaneously. Um, well, the, the one is is a reaction to the other. So, in some sense, the um, This is the, the, the huge division within the psyche, is that the unconscious mind was epistemologically prior and the, um, the superego was ontologically prior. And that, in some sense, is exactly what the unconscious mind wants, because it wants to say this is the world that I was born into. This is, this is the reality that I inherited. You know, it's part of its kind of ideological coherence, um, internal coherence, which eventually uh, gets lost because why is your ideological, con sorry, why is your ontologically prior condition, why is it um, haunting you? Uh, why is it se seemingly seeking revenge in a kind of, in an inconsistency, um, in a metaphysical inconsistency uh, that you can't contend with? It means that there's something wrong, something fundamentally wrong. Um, and then essentially you need the ego to help control that. And in so doing, it also debases the unconscious. Now, Okay, uh, yeah, these are the issues that I need to get into. Now, you see, what I've just laid out is somewhat idealistic. This is, this is the hopeful path of progress that I've just sort of laid out, but that doesn't always happen because sometimes the unconscious mind hangs on. It doesn't actually transfer, uh, to use uh, to the term that I've been using, the knowledge of good to the ego. It doesn't ever give up the keys to the car, it hangs on. Now, this has its own problem. Um, and so, I, I do think that there are a lot of skeptical personalities that are sort of, you know, so, so it's like they're, they're, they'll never stop being four years old in some sense. And essentially, this is this is the philosophy that they cling to because this is the only way that they can stop themselves from sort of having their unconsciousness dethroned. Or in a child, it would be better in 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 this circumstance, and so they are still running the ego as an emulation, um, as a kind of as an emulated hypothetical. Um, subject to which the the subconscious is the object so they've got these kinds of subject object relations in their mind um, and so essentially they are they are keeping them they're, they're keeping their their um, their identity at arm's length from the subject object relationship and then they're calling this some kind of you know like a some kind of higher empirical philosophy, you know, or, or some kind of, um, you know, so, so, so these are the kinds of um, metaphysical charlatans that are professing a kind of a cleaner, logical kind of, you know, well, you, you, you have to sort of force me and deduce me into actually giving up the, the value to the ego. Um, 
so there's a kind of uh, you know where they're 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 kind of they're sitting on the fence um, within their own psyche, and they've kind of developed an ideological kind of conditioning around that. Um, oh, that was a bit of a vague statement, but. Um, I mean, the, the problem with this is that it's not what they behave, it's not what they believe in some sense. Um, you know, it's very easy to kind of... Um, okay, I mean, there, there are two things here. I mean, you can talk about the, the kind of the intellectual case and claim that they have, which is very easy to debunk. I'm just talking about it from a psychological perspective now, which actually kind of puts them right... It puts it, it puts their case in a much better light because you know why should the one situation be preferred over the other one and I mean I guess the truth is is that it is the the toxic rhetoric itself is just it's so retarded I mean it, it literally I mean that is the technical it is the proper use of that word um, You know, there's this kind of contention that actually I should be retarded until someone can, uh, can, um, can drive me uh, into not being retarded, can, can sort of um, infuse me with some kind of certainty because they want to save the certainty and the kind of solipsistic um, control that, that the unconscious, um, you know, essentially they know, they don't want the knowledge of good to reside in the ego. They don't want their seat of consciousness to completely transfer over because they know that they won't be able to preserve it. It won't be able to stay pristine like it does in the unconsciousness, even though essentially as it stays in the unconsciousness, they have to create a kind of intellectual defense against the ego. Uh, they have to create some kind of stupid ideology um, around some kind of deductive certainty that they don't want to step out of the safe confines thereof. Um, So there, there is, uh, now I, I just want to, this is, might be somewhat inappropriate to bring up, but I just want to bring maybe a, an intellectual um, way of, of destroying the, the skeptical position. Uh, so the, the general skeptical position um, is basically drunk on its own conceit, that it has the obstacle that needs to be um, fulfilled you know it has the set of check boxes that have to be ticked you know so it itself is a um uh is asking the right questions so you know it really has to kind of presume some kind of whatever uh logical structure or or thinking you know sort of gate that it has conceived of that somehow that has a kind of parity with the source code of reality or the source code of rightness and wrongness and even the kind of the binary of right or wrong that that is born out in thought in thinking when you know nothing can be further f from the truth i mean well, these are some general philosophical contentions but thinking is never right or wrong um, you can never observe a correlation to be causative um, there is not any certainty in thought. In fact, what thought is, in some sense, um, it, thought is not reason. Uh, uh, in some sense, the only thing thinking is, is a, um, it's a, it's actually a double negative proposition. It's it thinking only makes sense in terms of correlating more than one object of thought so already to have any thinking you have to have more than one thought so you you have essentially a set of uh, contemplative 
uh, conditions or claims or features or properties or something like that. You've got these abstract notions um, or features and then you, you ask yourself in combination of these thoughts, would this not be self-inconsistent? Would this not be self-inconsistent? It's a double negative. So you can ask that question and you can get a result that is highly contextualized. It's highly tentative. It is fundamentally tentative. And this is why when you deal in hypotheticals and you have something like the scientific methodology, it's just, it's complete and utter nonsense. Um, you know, thoughts do not have predictive values. Um, they cannot, uh, because you can never, you can never witness or observe a correlation to be causative. So you'll never have certainty. So people use language very, slyly when they talk about science uh, they will say you know we've done the scientific rigor now we know that this could be true or this couldn't be true it's not correct that is that wording is completely um wrong they, they the best they can ever say is that this might be true and this might not be true and notice that when obviously they don't use that language because if they did they it would be obvious to everyone what a useless kind of thing that, that they're doing is, you know, it, it, you know, it might have some technical applications, it might have some useful, um, you know, results, that, you know, that might be useful. But the best thing that it can ever do to for you is give you a hint. Essentially, that's all thought does, is it offers you a hint. And just because you stack up more and more of the same hints, that hint toward the same disposition, then you've got one big hint. You don't have an authority. You don't have a bank of authority. It doesn't reach authority after a certain threshold. It just becomes a bigger hint, which still might be radically recontextualized by something else that comes along, by another hint that maybe, maybe can be consistent with some of those things and inconsistent with other of those things. And then you get a more sophisticated, nuanced, hint as to what's going on but again it never becomes concrete it never becomes certain um that's not what thought is it's not reason and so you know in some sense even if you have a, a bounded context context in which you have set thoughts and then you make a reading as to what would be self inconsistent that even itself is not certain and preserved because it might come later on that that whole that whole system will be recontextualized by something else that that there will be new things that bind the observer not just the subject matter you know and and so that there are it is impossible to create something greater than a hint out of thinking. And as I said, that hint, if you want to put it in technical language, you are working out what is not self-inconsistent. So if you only know what is not self-inconsistent, you can say it seems to be consistent. It seems, it appears to be consistent. But who would actually be precise enough to use that language and then debunk the, 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 cu the currency, the social currency of, of this kind of, of, of certainty? So um, that is traded off as, as, a, as, a, as the T-I-F-E kind of uh, um, authority and such. Uh, the false authorities, the, the, the dominions to be a part of, um, you know, which are essentially, they put all the tension into the future thinking, into the hypothetical, where essentially you've got an insoluble argument. And so it just becomes a question of, of who, can, who can make the better show 
of authority who can claim uh, and and so it, it loses its internal humility it it loses its um its its intellectual honesty at that point uh because it, it is prone to to um something that is not an economy of purpose uh it's it's an economy of appearances anyway um I probably exceeded uh, the tangents for this topic, so I'm going to stop recording.